Hi there, and welcome to Manningham Christian Centre's Sermon of the Week. I'm so glad you joined us. My name is Matt Wyatt, and I'm the lead pastor here. My prayer for you is that as you listen, you encounter God and find this message practically helpful. It would mean a lot to us if you were able to rate and subscribe. This not only lets us know how we can serve you better, but also spreads the message to those who need to hear it. Hey, thanks so much again, and I look forward to catching up with you later. Bye. Thank you, Matt. Good morning, everybody. How are you? Oh, thank you. Thank you. You can all have a seat. Get comfortable. Not too comfortable. Have you ever thought about the fact that Mary gave birth to Jesus? So he was at some point her little boy and Jesus was the Lamb of God. Yes. Give me a nod if you're following along. So Mary actually did have a little lamb. Oh, guys. Come on, that wasn't, the, that wasn't what I expected. I thought that was really funny. <laughs> All right, well, strap in. I've got a message for you and we're probably going in that direction. So if you didn't like that, just, I don't know, go get a drink or something. You'll be fine. No. Who remembers a few weeks ago when Matt told the story about him planting sunflowers for Anna? Do you remember that? All right. So for those of you who weren't with us or maybe you're watching for the first time or you're with us for the first time, Matt is the senior minister. He just introduced me. And Anna is his lovely wife. And Anna loves all things yellow. If you go to Anna's house, she has set out her whole house so beautifully with pops of yellow through the decor. It's really lovely. And one of the yellow things that Anna really, really likes is sunflowers. So Matt told us a story that he had planted these sunflowers in the garden so that when Anna looked out the window, she could see these glorious flowers and just feel so loved. Oh, sorry. It was beautiful. It was beautiful, right? And when these flowers were spent, he kept the heads, the flower heads, dried out the seeds, put them in storage, ready to plant in the next season. He planted them in the next season and they failed. Oh, and Anna didn't feel loved in that season. (laughs) No. So I haven't talked to Matt a heap about this But when I heard this story, I started to think, well, yeah, I know what, I think I know what's happened here. Did you know that a lot of plants and seeds that you buy commercially in the nurseries are actually genetically modified so that they won't go on to produce viable seeds? Did you know that? They're actually called seed terminators. And it's a technology called, and I want to get this right, it's not that, it's not the T1000, Genetic Use Restriction Technology, all simplified to GERT. That's probably the only time I'm ever going to use that acronym in that moment. But basically these seeds that are produced from the flowers or the fruit that people plant in their gardens are designed so that when they die and dry and hit the ground or get put in storage, they're actually not um, viable. They're sterile. They will not produce another plant. And if they do, some of them do, but that plant is much weaker. It won't fruit. It probably won't flower. It's unlikely to survive. It made me think of the parable of the sower. You know, in the parable of the sower, um, Jesus is talking and he's talking about a farmer who goes out to his field and he throws his seed out to plant his crop and some of that seed goes on the um, hard path, some of it goes into the rocky soil, some of it goes into an area where there are competing weeds and thorns and some of it lands on fertile ground. In this story, in this parable, there are three focus points. The sower, did that work? Oh, there we are. Good. Thanks, Jack. Jack, Jack's my backup plan because I'm not good at this. So there are three focus points in this. There's the sower, the seed, and the soil. The sower represents God who does 
so truth into our life, but it also represents us who are sharing the message and the, the truth of the gospel, yeah? So we also sow seeds. The seed is God's word, God's truth, and the soil is the condition of our heart to receive that truth and whether it's going to take root and ultimately fruit in our life. I don't think I've ever really thought about this parable in terms of I don't think I've ever really put myself in this parable. It's probably not a great thing to admit from the platform, but it's amazing how you can hear the same Bible verse or something over so many times. I was brought up in the church, so I've heard this parable a number of times, and yet God can drop a new truth into your life around it. I love that the word is dynamic and it is alive. But it made me start thinking, when I sow seeds... Now, I cannot change the truth of God, but I can certainly pick and choose. Oh, before I move on, actually, Matt, are you filming me? Looks like it. That's okay. Through the next season, and so your wife continues to feel loved, these seeds are heritage seeds. They're Van Gogh sunflowers. Let me show you was the picture that I skipped. All right, they're from diggers. So when you plant these seeds, Matt, they have the genetic material <laughs> to go on and produce good fruit. So I just wow. just wanted to sow that into your marriage. They're Van Gogh. They, they should be big. I think they inspired the famous sunflowers painting. Oh, wow. Those exact seeds. <laughs> That's what I'm saying. All right, sorry, we get back. Let's get back on track. Good. So it does make me think about how I sow and what I sow into the community, into my children's lives, into my friends' and family's lives, right? Because we sow by the very act. Like sowing is not just I pick up the Bible and I go and I say, hey, Julie, did you know this scripture? Blah, 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 right? And it's not just when you might have the opportunity to tell somebody that Jesus loves you. Sowing seeds of truth is how you act in the supermarket. It is the tone that you use on the phone when you're waiting for Centrelink to pick up. <laughs> it is... It is how you respond in the car when somebody steals your car parking spot. So it is actually your words, your choices, your tone, your presence, okay? We, are, we have an opportunity to sow and send out messages all the time. And in thinking about seeds and modified seeds that are actually unviable, I guess it makes me think about what seeds am I sowing? Am I sowing the seeds of truth that are biblical and please God's heart that will go on and take root and fruit in somebody's heart if the condition of their heart is right? Or am I picking and choosing the truth that I want to prioritise in my life? Am I going about kind of diminishing some of the the standard that God would hold for me. Now, don't get me wrong, God is not punitive, um, but he does set out a pretty high standard in his word. If we look at Matthew, it starts, it talks in there about, he starts talking about the Ten Commandments and he starts saying, you've heard that you shouldn't murder people. I hope that's not news to anyone in the room. <laughs> but that is the base standard. Okay, but he goes on to say that if you hold a grudge in your heart against your brother or he says if you call him a fool or racker, which is a, a, another word for like fool in the times, that, that, that anger in your heart is equivalent to murder. He doesn't look at murderers and hateful people and go, oh, you're better than them. He just goes, you're carrying hate in your heart. And he also talks about lust. He says, you've heard that you shouldn't adulter. To enter into adultery, a relationship. If you're married, you shouldn't go and have a relationship with someone else. I mean, who's got the time? But you, do, you shouldn't do it, right? But, but you might think, well, I'm obviously I'm not going to go cheat on my husband, but I do like to look. I don't mind 
opening up a little pornography every now and then. I don't mind entertaining thoughts in my mind of what it might be like to date Chris Hemsworth. Jesus says that having lust in your heart is the same as committing adultery. It is actually a high standard. And when I go through my life, when I go to the pub with friends to have a few drinks, there is an opportunity there to hold a standard or to prioritise maybe the relationship with my friends. I am going to absolutely admit that I have found myself myself in, in positions as an adult, like in my 40s, out with my friends where everyone's having a great time and they're drinking a whole bunch and, you know, they start having conversations that maybe you wouldn't have if Jesus was sitting at the table. And I guess I've got an opportunity there. Now I'm not going to get up and go, guys, Jesus says don't do this. Okay, but I do have an opportunity for myself of maybe reining that in a bit and keeping to the standard that Christ would have of me. And so it makes me wonder, and I just guess I did a little self-review and self-reflection about I really, really want to sow seeds of life, seeds of truth, and it goes so far beyond my words, goes so far beyond what I post on Instagram. It's it's my whole life that is hopefully a message of the truth of Jesus. And honestly, anything less than God's truth is a modified seed that will not produce good fruit. Oh, what a downer. What a downer first point. But it's true. The other thing about this parable is that when I've heard this parable in the past and it talks about the soil, I've always kind of envisaged it, I think very visually, so I've always kind of pictured that soil that, that Jesus is talking about as being the hearts of people who are um, unsaved, people who don't, haven't accepted Jesus into their life. It's the world, it's, it's the world, it's not me. I started to think about, oh, well, hang on. What if I put my position, myself in the position of the receiver of his truth? I've had a good hard think about the seeds that I sow, but what about the seeds that are sown in my direction? I've got some fantastic people in my life who will hold me accountable, who will speak the truth to me. I come to church each week and I do, I hear some, we hear some fantastic messages from here, yeah? I, I listen to a few podcasts. All of that doesn't mean that my heart is in a condition that I can or am willing to accept that truth. And one thing that really sticks out to me is that we are very comfortable. A lot of us, I would hazard a guess that even the most uncomfortable person in this room is still more comfortable than somebody in a third world country or a, a completely very low demographic community with a lack of resources and, and not having their basic needs met. There's a real risk there. And in the parable of the sower, he talks about that. I want to bring up the right scripture. Give me just a second. He talks about the soil with the weeds in it. And says that, that some of those weeds, those rocks, is actually comfort and privilege and, it, and independence and pride. It's not just like big sin. It's not just stubbornness. It's actually that we've become so comfortable in our lives, so self-reliant in our lives, so successful in our lives that we forget where our success comes from and where... Our God is in that. I've put together a little visual for you. And I'm going to read out from Deuteronomy. Deuteronomy 8, 11 to 14. Be careful that you do not forget the Lord your God, failing to observe his commands, his laws, his decrees that I'm giving you up on this day. Otherwise... When you eat and are satisfied, 
when you build fine houses and settle down, when your herds and flocks grow large and your silver and gold increase, you become proud. Your heart becomes proud and you will forget the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt and out of the land of slavery. It can be a trap. This is why the Bible says that it is easier for a camel to pass through the eye of the needle than a rich man to enter heaven. Because it's not because wealth is bad. Wealth is not bad. Wealth is a gift from the Lord. Business success is a gift from the Lord. But when you start looking at that gift and that wealth and that comfort and not looking at the Lord anymore and you start thinking, I'm okay, that is when you move away from Jesus and you start and pride starts to enter into your heart. And I mean, I'm, I'm not a super wealthy person, okay? I mean, if you compare me to, I guess there are others in the world that you would compare me to and I probably am a super wealthy person because there's a lot of opportunity in Australia. But I have some wins under my belt, you know. I've had some small business financial success. I've, I've run a, quite a successful charity. We have a great team. I do have some wins under my belt. I live in a comfortable house in a wonderful marriage with healthy children It isn't hard for me to start thinking about what's the next thing I'm going to do. We just launched some socks. It's true. Yeah, my company just launched some socks that when you buy a pair of socks, a pair of socks is given to a person in need. Um, It's called Good Deeds, okay? It's very easy for me to think about what's the next thing? What's the next thing I'm going to do? Because I've got some capital behind me. I've got some skills. I've got some wins. I feel a bit confident. I've got a great business partner. But do I sit back and go, Lord, what actually is the next thing for you that you think I would do? What's the next step for CareNet? I know what I think in my mind and in my skill and my, you know, knowledge, but do I, do I have that moment where I turn to Jesus and, or do I forget? Do I forget because now I feel like I can do this by myself? There's a lot about our lives that we think we can do by ourselves and there is a lot about your life that you should do kind of just using your common sense, right? God doesn't want to get, you don't, you don't need to get up in the morning and ask God what colour socks you wear or what I mean if I got up this morning and said what shoes should I wear clearly the Lord would have said these ones anyway (laughs) right but there are there are things you know but we get comfortable do you know what I'm saying we get comfortable we take our eyes off the Lord we forget that the good things that we have actually came from the Lord the other thing is wealth is an incredible buffer between us and consequences. I've had a speeding ticket or two. Sorry, Sam. And the the worst thing is that my car is actually registered to Sam's name. So he always knows. And then he he transfers those points over to me. (laughs) And I'll be honest and say that when I get a speeding ticket, I'm like, no, I don't want to pay that money, right? And I mean, I've, my points are okay. I don't get that many speeding tickets. But I, I don't actually stop and think about the fact that I broke the law and that the law exists for a reason and, and part of what God asks us to do is abide by the law, his law and the law of the land. And I, do I have that moment of repentance where I go, oh, I am actually sorry that I did that? I don't think I do. I more think about I don't want to pay that money and then I pay it and I go because honestly the fine is not, it's not not comfortable. Like it's not, it's uncomfortable but it's not life changing for me. I know if some of my people that come and receive food from us got a fine in the mail, I know when their car breaks down or something else happens and they, they get a fine in the mail, that is life-changing for them. So that, that changes their whole week. That throws them into such stress. 
but I pay the fine, I'm a bit annoyed about it and I move away because my privilege buffers me from having to carry that. Donald Trump was just in February fined $600 million. <sighs> if I get fined even a million dollars, I'm, I'm probably on my knees praying, Jesus help, right? He got fined $600 million. But he is worth, I think Forbes says he's worth $7.7 billion. Now, I'm not, I don't want to talk about Trump. I don't want to talk about Trump. But I can't help but think that $600 million in that context is, is probably still uncomfortable, but his wealth and privilege buffers him from the consequence of that. And when we are buffered in comfort and privilege, that we are even less likely to turn to the Lord. We are even less likely to have a moment of repentance. And I think that God is speaking to us collectively at the moment and raising a standard. He wants us to live a, a standard. He wants the, the community to see his glory. He wants us to sow the actual truth that will bear good fruit in people's hearts. And for us to do that, we have to make sure that our heart is the good soil, that when the truth comes and rests on our heart, however it may come to us, that we are ready and willing to act on it, not just go, that was a great sermon and move into our week and forget about it, but to think, oh, I actually could probably be a bit more alert there. I think any time we find ourselves in an uncomfortable position where we start going, oh, it doesn't matter, it'll be fine, it doesn't matter, it'll be fine, and we just try and move away from it, maybe we would be better to have a moment where we turn towards Jesus and say, Jesus, this is uncomfortable, what is it? Maybe you need to repent Maybe he has something to tell you about the next step. But we are so socialised to avoid discomfort. Move away from discomfort at all cost. The world would tell you if it feels good, it's probably fine. Well, I'm here to tell you if it feels good, it might be fine. But if it feels good and it doesn't line up with the word, it's not fine. So I'm preparing this message and I really like to bring a message that is really like encouraging and uplifting and I know that this message is challenging some people today. And to be honest, this message is because God is speaking to me about this at the moment. We all need a tweak. We all need a fine tune, okay? The person that stands on this platform has not got it all together. I know that's a shock to you. And I came to a point where I'm like, but Lord, you said your yoke is easy and your burden is light. And this standard doesn't feel like that. <laughs> this moment of revelation doesn't feel like that, Lord. But there is good news. And the good news is that his yoke is easy and his burden is light because he's talking about a yoke we don't, we don't live in an agricultural society anymore and we don't really use ox to till paddocks anymore. I mean, so maybe some people do, but I don't see it. But a yoke is actually the big piece of wood that sits across the shoulders of two beasts. Not one, it's not a draft horse pulling a cart, it's two beasts. And he is saying, come to me all who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. A yoke is a work tool, okay? And anybody who works in this room is going to tell you that work is work, okay? 
But work is easier when you are equipped to do the job and you are in a good supportive environment. We are entering his yoke and he is the other beast on the other side. And so when we stay side by side with the Lord and we move with the Lord, we share the load. We share the load of what he asks of us. But interestingly, in a yoke, one is not doing more work than the other. Jesus has done everything that he needs to do to invite us into relationship with him. He, he went to the cross and he died for our sins. We don't have to make sacrifices like blood sacrifices like they did in the Old Testament. He invites us in all these different ways. He waits willingly. He says, come to me. But when we come to him and we stand beside him and we choose to be yoked to him, we move together forwards, yeah? But that doesn't mean that I'm really pulling or he's really pushing. It's a journey and it's a process and he will carry an equal part of the burden. The other thing that a yoke can refer to is, you know, when you see the scales and they've got the little buckets on each side, that bar is also called a yoke. Jesus will balance the load with you. What you lack on the scale or what you put on the scale, he will balance that load with you. It's a promise. So he will share the work. He will share the burden. He will balance the scales on your behalf. And that is why his yoke is easy and his burden is light. And he offers us rest because there is no way I'm going to go away from this moment and this bit that I'm thinking about and I will continue to think about and not find myself in another position where I have to really hold the standard and be the person that I want to be. And there's, I'm going to find myself in those situations and guess what, guys? I'm not going to get every one of those situations right. But although we are yoked and asked to be at a standard, the rest comes from understanding that Jesus' mercies are endless. His blood covers all sin, all bad choices, every, all, all negative thought, all bad choices. It's covered by sin when you bring it to him and you repent and he covers it with the blood. And as Matt said earlier, he throws it as far as from the east as from the west, which is actually an infinite distance. That is where your rest can come from because his standard is high and his yoke is work. But he'll walk with you and when you get it wrong, he will be gracious. If you get it wrong and you turn back to him, and that's the key, isn't it? Turn back to him. I got it wrong, Lord. That's when he moves you from glory to glory. That's when you are freed from that bad choice. That's when your sin is gone, covered, white as snow. That is where you can rest easy. At the head of my organisation, sometimes I feel an incredible amount of responsibility. I have staff. I have hundreds if not thousands of people depending on the food supply and I don't have a lot of control over that food supply. And sometimes the weight of that is really stressful, particularly when funding is short, food supply is short and the people just keep coming, okay? What gets me through is knowing that I'm not alone also, 
What gets me through is knowing that when I make a decision on behalf of this organisation to try something new, I'm probably going to fail at some things. Yeah, we've had some failures this year. But I know in my heart that I'm in a safe place to fail because I know I don't carry that burden by myself and I know that I don't... Um, I know that whole thing doesn't rest on me and no one's going to point the finger at me and and I we will be able to recover as long as I'm like not horrendously ridiculous, you know, exercise a certain amount of wisdom, but I'll be okay, we'll be okay. I know that. That comes from the rest that God has put in me and the people that I have around me. And what I'm saying to you today is yes, God wants you to sow seeds of truth and he doesn't want you to pick and choose between those seeds. Yes, God holds you to a high standard and lust in your heart is the same as adultery. A white lie is the same as a big lie. We are the ones that like to find loopholes and split out the truth. God holds you to a higher standard. But yes, Jesus will carry it with you. When you get it wrong, it is okay to fail occasionally. Turn back to Jesus. Repent. Look at the scripture. Ask him for help to do better. Get back into that yoke with him. Walk side by side with him. And yes, do super well in your businesses. Have lovely houses. Wear great clothes. Go on wonderful holidays. When you can, yes, but stay even closer to Jesus because recognise that privilege and wealth and comfort can be a trap that takes your eyes off Jesus. The last picture I want to leave you with is that Jesus' yoke is not the stock's. You know the medieval stocks where people put their hands and their head through and they close it over and you're stuck there? Like, it's not the stocks. Jesus doesn't lock you into the stocks. You are not trapped by Jesus. Partly, I think it would be helpful if I was trapped by Jesus. Sometimes that would be really good, Jesus. But When we are yoked with Jesus, we do have an opportunity to go, I don't want to do this anymore and get distracted and walk off. And if you're in that position today, all you have to do is walk back. Jesus says it's as easy as turning your eyes to him and he will come back to you. If you want to be at his side, he so wants to be at your side. And that's what I want to leave you with today. If you got something from that message today or if you feel like you might like some prayer um, to stand in prayer with somebody, I'm sure that Julie and Matt, myself, will be down the front to pray with you. But I hope you have a blessed week and I hope you feel as challenged as I feel because when we rise to this challenge, that is when we're going to see fruit in the community, when we live that life. Thanks, guys. Well, thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Anna. I trust that during the service, God was moving in your heart and his presence was where you are. Just before we say goodbye today, I'd love to give you an opportunity to say yes to Jesus. If today's message spoke to you, or you've been considering believing in Jesus as your savior, then I would love to invite you to do that now. Would you repeat this short prayer after me? Dear Jesus, I believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins and that you rose again to give me life. I ask you to forgive my sins and be my Lord and my Saviour. I open my heart to you today. Amen. If you said yes to Jesus today, We would love to hear from you. We would love to celebrate with you, pray with you, and help you start your Jesus journey. 
Visit our website, manninghamcc.org, and go to the I Said Yes page. Fill out your details, and one of our leaders will get in touch with you. We would love to hear your story. Hey, thanks for joining in today and being part of our service. If you enjoyed today's service, would you click the share button and subscribe to MCC so you can stay connected? We all need some good news, and we would love to hear how God has spoken to you today. Visit manninghamcc.org and fill out a good news story form today. If you would love to know more how to grow in your relationship with God, then Next Steps provides the path for you. Visit manninghamcc.org to find out more. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time.